Hello everybody, welcome to this Code Rage X session called Data Snap Deep Dive Building Any Tire Applications. I'm Kelvin Merlotti, an Embarcadero MVP in Brazil. I work as editorial coordinator at Active Delft Magazine, also as independent software consultant, specialist on any tire and mobile development. I work with Delft for about 15 years and there are my contact information. Today, We'll have some fun talking about what's new in data snap on Red Studio 10 Seattle, talking about security features, features like authentication, authorization, and transport filters, talking about performance and with cache with caching and REST filters, and about responsiveness with callbacks. Let's start with what's new in data snap. The first thing to mention is that DataSnap HTTP and HTTPS now don't use indie libraries anymore. They use the native net library of the operation system. And this means that we don't need to deploy the open SSL client library with our DataSnap client. Also, with DataSnap and FireDAC related, related we have uh, an enhancement on the FireDAC JSON Reflect library framework uh, that are now automatically able to compress the traffic between the server and the client. And a new sample on the DataSnap folders that shows how to use the FireDAC schema adapter component to handle master detail relationships on your softwares. It's a good sample to take a look. Now talking about authentication and authorization. First, I would like to talk about the difference between these two features because many developers even don't know what they mean. Uh, the authentication process is what happens when someone tries to sign in into your server and the authorization happens when already when someone already signed it in tries to do something. With that said, there's no way to authorize someone that wasn't authenticated yet. And at the same time, if you are authenticated, if you're already authenticated, you still may not be authorized to do something. That's the basic difference. And how do we authenticate a user? On the DataSnap framework, there's a component called DDS Authentication Manager that needs to be linked with our transportation handler component that is HTTP or TCP. And it has an event handler called on authenticate and, at, and this event provide three uh, basic information for us that is the protocol that's being used if it's HTTP, HTTPS or TCP the context that be, that's being used and the user credentials like username and password with this information, with this data on your hand, you can decide if this that operation is valid or not. You can select your database and check if the user exists, if he, he or she has privilege to log in, in your server, and then say the server tell the tell the server that he is able to log in, that these credentials are valid. At the same time, you can tell the server on which roles this user is uh, able to sign in. The, user, the, the roles will help you later decide this which or what the user can or cannot do on the authorization process. By the way, the authorization happens in at least two moments. You can authorize something at least in two moments. One of them is the is using the T role attribute attribute on over your classes and methods. Just on the line above you can 
put on the tiro layout attribute that says which roles can and which roles cannot use that resource that class or that method and also the authentication manager component has a collection called rules where you can specify each methods or classes are able or are allowed or are denied to use your server one important thing to note is that the TDS authentication manager roles collection will override any T layout attribute that's in your code. So let's see authentication and authorization in practice. So here I have a server, a DataSnap server and DataSnap, DataSnap client. On this server, we have a server container that was generated by the DataSnap server wizard. And here is the main component responsible for the security of the DataSnap server, the DS Authentication Manager. On his own user authenticate event handler is where we can check, we can test if the user credentials are valid or not, and assign to this user a role. In this sample, I am calling a method, a class method called valid user that is implemented on this data module with just a Firedeck connection and a query that selects from the employee table the number of the employee and the and his job code considering his last name as username and his phone extension as the password so we have a class method here that receives the user and password pass to the to those parameters its values then we open the query and if this query isn't empty the user was found and it's a valid user then we will return valid through as the function result and also the employee number and their job code back to the server container we will receive these three information that it if it's valid or not his ID and his role and if it's valid if it's a valid user we will register his ID on the session and test if the role this user has is one of this selected roles to be an admin if this employee doesn't apply in any of these job roles we will assign to him the user profile and now that he we told the server that he's a valid user and told him in each profile or in each role he's assigned to we can authorize this user when he tries to do something in something special let's say and to demonstrate this usage I define it here on the authentication manager on its rules collection that all the times all the times that a user calls an apply update method only the admins user or only the users that was us that were assigned to the admin role will be able will be authorized to do this apply updates 
so users profile will never apply updates only the admin ones and beyond that on our server methods that has just three methods the two generated with the wizard the equal string and reverse string and a new method called get salary this method will only be able to be executed by admin users so if any employee that were assigned to the user profile won't get to execute this method let's run the server and take a look on the client here we just make a connection to our database data snap server using the user credentials that was inputted here and we have the possibility to execute the get salary method through the SQL server method here is the method we're gonna call also we can get the customers opening the client data set and try to apply those updates that will be able only to admin users let's run the client now and check if it's working first we will log in with a user that are not on those job on those selected jobs his password oh, is six now we connected if we try a different password it won't connect it will reject the user credentials so we can so only the specified users that on the database achieve will be able to log in on the data snap server and just those authorized users will get the salary you can see that he can't perform the requested action and also this kind of users won't be able to change the data he can change locally but when he tries to apply the updates it will fail again as he is not authorized if we connect with some user that is on the admin role we can get the salary from any employee we can execute the get salary function we can change the values of the data and apply the updates in no without any problems that's it with authentication and authorization more about authentication and authorization you can see on those links that will be available as soon as possible when code erase x ends and all the materials will be available let's continue the, with transport filters so what the filter is that <laughs> a transport filter in summary is a code or it, it's your code a custom class that will be executed over the bytes that will be sent and received by the server and the client applications so it's a way you can manage or monitor everything that that is transferred between the peers of your application and red studio brings three built-in filters ready to use they are one compression filter based on zlib and two encryption filters based on rsa and pc1 all these filters 
take effect only with TCP transportation and both client and servers need to have the filter declared. Also, filters can be customized extending the TDBX transport dot transport filter class, the transport filter class that on the DBX transport unit. On the documentation, we also have a new material, uh, even a uh, step by step of how to create a filter. And now we have about, uh, we'll take a look about filters in practice. Here we're using the same server and client from the other sample from the authentication sample and what we need to do to enable the filters are really simple on the server side we need to go to your TCP server transport component and on the filters collection you need to add the filters you want here I added the compression filter on our server and on the client side did the same on the SQL connection component if we expand here the driver properties we also have a filters collection where we need to specify the filters we are using so here I use the same filters and another important thing to remember is to add to the use clauses of your unit just in one of your unit the DBX compression filter if you're using the compression filter as in this, in this example. Now if you run the server and the client we can do that everything works on the same way. Here we go, connect to the user, get the salary, and get the customers and go on. But I use it an application called raw cap that monitors the traffic over TCP IP, the local traffic of TCP IP and got these two files and I would like to show you first the file with, with where when the server was wasn't with filters there was no filters in the server and client and on the method that was called to get the customers it had to execute two times two fetches from the server one with this length 1460 plus 761 bytes it costs two fetches to get the data and when we enabled the filter on the client application the same request could be done with one single fetch of 1400 bytes so almost 800 bytes smaller so it's really a nice feature that's built in and ready to use with data snap more about transport filters you can see on those links that as I said will be available as soon as possible when code rage X ends or if you want mail me and I'll send you now talking about caching well think about it 
is there anything faster to process that what doesn't need to be processed? I'm sure there's not. Uh, so that's where cache makes sense. And DataSnap has a feature to an interesting feature to be used with REST servers, mainly on mainly when you're using non-Delphi or C++ Builder clients that are REST parameter caching. In summary, when a method returns more than one complex, one or more complex types like streams, it can tell the client that those data are stored in cache and then tells this to this client how they can get this information. So at the first time, it will answer a content like this, that means the IDs of the method, cache, and parameters. So the client can make uh, another request like this here and ask the server to give this, to give him back those information that, that's on the cache. And not so data snap related, but in a more conceptual way, I think you should think more about caching data. It's almost always a good idea. I know it's not so easy to do, but in your production environment, it's too valuable. You can do it in many ways on the server side, on the client side, that in my opinion, it's preferred on the client side. Data that don't change often are really good candidates to be cacheable, like a list of countries, states, cities, measurement units, and so on. Every kind of data that doesn't change often is really a good candidate. You need to take a look on, on this idea. Of course, it's really important to have uh, an invalidation mechanism so you can tell the client or the client can know itself that that data that he that it has on his hands on its hands isn't valid anymore and then ask again for new data this kind of this uh, kind of invalidation process can be done in many ways, but generally they are made by lifetime, setting a date and time to that cache expire, and also about the data change using a hash of the cache. You can calculate a hash of the cache you have locally and ask to the server if that data is still valid or if it's changed or even with a version control of your data and interbase has a really nice feature called change views that is perfect in these scenarios you need to take a look on it about the cache on the client side it's important to to mention that it's preferable because you will avoid unnecessary traffic to your database server, to your application server, and hence to the database server. So you will you will have a sh really shorter way to get data. They are local, and for sure it will need more attention. You will need more to need take care about invalidating those data that you store locally. You can consider using client data sets or Firedac memory table to store this data in an easy way. You can just call the safety file, for example, and have the data stored. And another interesting thing you can use to navigate in your local data is the Firedac local SQL feature that will help you to do queries over your local data. And remember, 
on one important thing to remember in most cases you don't need to synchronize your cache it's a waste of time just drop it and create again not in all these cases but in the most cases about a cache on the server side it allows us to avoid unnecessary database access that is also a good idea uh, but less helpful than the, on, the cache on the client side in my opinion it can be done using uh, two ways in, in, in two ways using one single cache to all the clients or a per client or per session class cache if you decide to do a single cache to all the clients you can use a life you, you can the, you can use the life cycle property of your tds server class to show to tell the server that that class will be a single instance in all the server this makes more sense in all this in all the cases but it's not always possible you might you, you may you may find some troubles implementing this in in some cases and if you use the session lifecycle each client will have your own cache let's take a look at the caching demo to the caching demo we created a data snap rest server application and on the server methods unit we added two methods that returns one image as a stream or two images as a stream one in the result and the other on a out parameter and to test the parameter caching we'll put a breakpoint here and run the application and test it on the browser let's take a look here in Chrome we have a debugging tool that is activated with the function 12 key and I also have a tool that's called change HTTP request reader that enables us to make some changes on the headers that are sent in the request so first what I'll do here is to call the get image method and we can see here that a session was opened in the in our data snap server then this is his ID the response was the image the single image that we got if we if you need it as a JSON you can put this parameters on the end of the URL and it will give you an array of bytes in the JSON format now if we get the get images method but before it I'll make some changes first saying the this session ID in the pragma header as the it is app engine requires to tell the server that this request is on the same session that the request made earlier and on the accept header I'll tell the server that I want application slash rest content when I do these changes on the this change in the re reader on the request header I'm telling the server that he is able to cache complex types now if I do execute the this request it will execute the method 
now you can see that the breakpoint was activated and back into the browser we had two uh, sorry we had a download file because it was in a stream but we don't want this content we want the cache content now if we change the URL to this one we'll have an image and take a look that the breakpoint wasn't enabled so it was not processing our request it was get the getting the value from the cache okay so here it is the rest parameter cache of data snap working now the other part of the cache we talk about was data cache of data and what I did here was to create another server method descended from the data module and this server method I just dropped a SQL uh, Faraday connection and the Faraday query listing all the countries from the from the employee database and the method countries returns a data set what I do if is if the memory table is not active I open the query and copy the query data set to the memory table and result and send as result this memory table so the next request to this method will not open the query again because the memory table will be active and will only send its content again so if we open one client one client to this application and get the countries the breakpoint is stopped the query is open and the data is copied to the memory table and return it to the client application now I'll open another client and get the countries again and look that the breakpoint wasn't enabled because the memory table is already active and his content was sent this is a kind of cache from the server side we had an instance a single instance of the server method that it, this was done using the server class lifecycle here on our server container in this case in our web module I have another server class which lifecycle is server it means that only one instance of this server method of this data module will be available until all the life of the server no matter which client request it will have get the data from the same source from this instance of server method then we have a cache in the server side but why what I also did is that when the the client gets his data it saves locally its data here it is and this means that even when the server is not running but we get an instance of the client we can get the data it's there it's locally we don't need to go to the server and come on how many times this kind of data will change in years isn't it so it totally it's totally possible to store this kind of data locally and sometimes to check if it's necessary to update your local cache 
the clear cache just drops this local data and will force a new fetch from the server. In this case it failed because the server is not running. If we start it and try again, it, we probably will get the results. There it is. And let's just, before I finish, take a look in the client side how it was done. It's really simple. On the get countries button, we test if the file exists and load the data from the file. If not, we call the countries method from the new server method we've created and copy the result, the data set that it results to the memory table. You know, the, uh, on the clear cache button, it's just to delete the file that was specified in, uh, in this constant. So it's just an idea to make you think more about cache or data. On these links, you can find more about caching, specifically about parameter caching, that it's a data snap REST feature. Now, let's talk about REST request filters. In summary, the REST request filters are more related to REST than data snap itself. And if you're not familiar with REST, you should start studying about it on this link, for example, restapitutorial.com. In summary, REST servers generally has a way to select from the content that will be sent to the client which part of it will be sent. And uh, this is called REST request filters, a way to filter to select from the content what will be sent. They're used at the end of the URL, like this example. After the method and params, parameters, you can put a question mark and the filter dot the function equals the parameters. Data Snap has two built-in REST filters that are, that are substrings and tables. The substring filter can operate on strings and its characters or on streams and it by in its bytes. It has three functions that are count, offset and range. Count on, with count function you can tell how many characters from the first starting from the first characters you want to return. The offset how many characters you want to skip from the first and the range has two parameters to tell the count and the offset really useful to do a kind of pagination the table filter has the same three functions but they operate over the records of a table of a data set so you can specify the numbers of records you want to send to the client starting from the first using the count function. You can tell the server which records you want to skip sending to the client using the offset function or using the range function. You can tell the both things at the same time. Tell the server from where do you want to start and how many records, records do you want to send to the client. Let's see request filters in practice. To this demo, I created a data snap REST server that has mainly two methods. They are uh, the echo string and the customers method that opens uh, query and return it to the client. Let's run the server and on the client side we have 
at the top I wait to test the substring filter remember that the substring is also applied to streams so here we can test over characters but you can also do the same with the bytes of the string for example the count function will return the first five letters uh, first we need to start our server and then echo string the first five letters if we use the offset function it will skip the five and if we use the range function for example skipping five getting ten it will get the ten letters after ten characters after the first five characters and with the customers with the data or the table filter what we did is was to specify the number of records per page and when we get the customers it is filtered skipping at the first page no records and getting 10 count 10 the next page it will skip 5 and get more 5 and the third page skip 10 and get more five and so on this was done using this property current page and the get data method this get data will get the filter according to the page so we get the count from the spin edit and this keep is based on the current page then we'll, we mount, we will create this filter and the get data method will call the customers method passing this filter to the server remember that when using filter you are still loading all the content in the server and after load it you are you will filter what co goes to the client so pay attention on where and how you use the filters you can find more about rest request filters on those links that point to to embark their documentation and to the red in action event that happened some times ago now let's talk about callback and what is callback so let's think about it when you call someone he or she can call you back right that's what a server does if a client calls a server this server can call this back calls back this client okay but why well it gives the server the a possibility to talk to the client in a proactive way so it doesn't need to wait a request anymore it can in a proactive way talk to the client for example when a client requests something to the server when we make a request to the server we don't know what's happening there until the request the, this request is processed and the response comes to the client on the other side the server doesn't know it doesn't make any idea doesn't have any idea about how to tell the client what's happening it only knows that he received a request a request it will process this request and when it ends it will send back the response to the client if you tells the server that he has a way to talk to you while it's processing your request he can update you about the process hey I'm doing the step one I'm doing the step two I'm doing the step three hey client here you are here the, here we go your response and many things would be responsiveness great uh, but how do we do that using a callback method 
or a callback channel. Let's see in practice. To the callback sample, first we'll take a look at the callback method. Here I have a button that calls a method on the server called generate report. And this method has an interesting parameter that is a dbx callback and that's the key point to the callback method. Here we can tell the server how it can call us back. We will send a structure that the dbx framework implements to a bit to give the server the ability to send us some JSON value and when we receive this JSON value we will call the update progress method passing to it the value and the update progress method will only use the synchronize thread method to update the label and the progress bar here on the screen and while the main thread will be busy waiting to this response, the server will be sending us the feedback about what is he doing, and we do and we need to do this in a thread method using the synchronize. So on the server side, what happens is that on the generate report we simulate. Uh, uh, a process doing a, a for from the start to the end and waiting to it and on each step we create a status that is a JSON object and add one value to this object in this case only the step we are only the number of the step we are we could do many values as we want here on this callback method and just handle this data on the client side to update your screen but now only we need is this feature this implementation the client will send the server uh, an object away a callback object to tell the server how it can call back the client. So when we get the report, at this time the main thread is busy waiting for the report, but the server is sending us back the feedback about what is it doing, and then we can update the progress. This is how the callback methods works. Now let's take a look about the channel the callback channel. Uh, on the server we don't need anything else, anything different to implement a callback channel because everything we need already is is already on the DDS server. For example, if we get its name we, we can see that we have the broadcast message for example and here you can pass the callback name. But on the client side, it's where the key point appears because I thought the server could talk to the client. First, the client needs to tell the server how to talk to him. Here we saw how to do this using a callback method. And to create a channel to a server with a server, we use this component, the client callback channel manager. It has two main properties that are the channel name and the manager ID. Then we on, we can on the on create event we can generate a name to this callback and the name to its manager. Now the Channel Manager component can register a callback using these IDs with the callback name and mainly the 
process, the, the, the object that will be used to this, uh, used by the server to send the content. That's the same object we used on the callback method. Just in, in this case, it's just a simple example. Now, with that said, when, when we register a callback, it's like we have a way, an open door between the server and the client. And if we have more open clients, they could talk with the server and broadcast message. For example, let me connect this and this client and I want to send this number to everybody that's listening to the channel. And there you go, they're listening. It. If I send a number l less than 10, that the max of the progress bar at this time, it will work. And another thing we need, we're able to do is to send to an, a specific client. So if I get these credentials and say and send a different value to this specific ID, only this client will receive. Otherwise, if I send some value to the entire channel, everybody that w was registered in this channel ID will receive that message. And this is the callback channel. Now let's get back to the presentation and you can find more about the callback on those links and I would like to to mention that it is also possible to have heavyweight callbacks using HTTP connections and here are the materials you can read about and watch to implement heavyweight callbacks using HTTP connections. It's a really important thing to be aware of. And that's it by now. Just to finish, please explore the data snap features. They are there to use and they work, work fine. Take a look at the samples that are on the, the your documents public, uh, probably on your documents, your public documents if you didn't change the setting on when you install your Delphi. Study those samples. It, it, they are a really good source of knowledge. Uh, wizards never will never give us the best results. Go further, try to understand what the wizard does, try to start something from scratch, try to comprehend what each component is doing in your application. It will allow you to have more control to find problems easiest. So study beyond the wizards and uh, always plan your server thinking considering your deployment scenario your production environment even the network quality should be considered for example if you have a unstable network or slow a really slow network you won't have success using TCP IP communication. You should go with REST over HTTP. Also, read about database connection pooling and use it. FireDAC has a really easy way to implement connection pooling, database connection pooling, and it's, it can grow your performance and your response time. Some database engines 
support this this feature, this kind of pulling right on the 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 engine, the database engine, but FireDAC and DB Express also has also have their way to implement connection pooling. So take a look on it. And remember that lightness is never enough. Science for goal is the best is the best performance ever to be as fast as possible. But only heavyweight efforts will bring lightweight results. Thank you guys for now and feel free to stay in touch. Let's go now to the leave Q&A. Yeah, one of my suggestions, Alan, is that you can, uh, is that what Kelver said is you can post, capture the messages that Apache, if it puts a message. The other thing is if you think you're getting malformed JSON, you can save the JSON out to a local file and you can attach that to a quality portal at quality.marketer.com and put a case in so we can look. You should also be able to, but that's after it goes through the server. I was thinking if it was coming into your DataSnap server, you could use the JSON libraries in the runtime library to see what's going wrong in the JSON. I don't know if it's being uh, clobbered by, um, you know, some, uh, you know, bad connection, we're dropping bits or bytes, but those are just a few suggestions. Uh, I don't know why Apache would die and restart because there's a problem in a data stream. Uh, it's just housed in an HTTP or HTTPS. So, Kelber, any other advice? Yeah, I think so too. I think we we need to investigate. There's not too much to suggest at this point. Uh, Greg is asking about the samples in C++. We are working on it. It's not too different from the, the Object Pascal ones. In summary, we just need to have a method that inherits the DBX callback class and register your tenure or pass this object in a method to the server. It's really simple, but we are working on the translation of the object Pascal samples to C++. Let me see if there's any other. Rob is asking about the XML support instead of JSON. Well, I I don't think there's a, a native way to to answer requests using XML with DSNF. Of course, you can uh, define your method as a string and uh, fill the, the result, the uh, the function result with your XML. But as far as I know, there is no way to to response to to give response in XML. I don't know if David has any other considerations. No, I just put the same note about you can create uh, a method and have it be a string and just populate the parameter with XML and and pass it along. Uh, you don't uh, if you're doing TCP or HTTP and not JSON, you can do your own marshalling. That's always been there. Uh, since the early days, right, Kelber? Yeah, that's what I I, I, th I was thinking about too. Uh, Rob is, is saying that it, he thinks maybe a Marshall object that can return XML. I don't know about it. Need to investigate more. Maybe it's a, a suggestion, but I will do on this way. Will return on a string and populate this with my own XML. Let me see if there's one more. There was one more about uh, binary instead of JSON. Again, I guess you're on marshalling your own objects. Sorry, David, I didn't understand you. 
uh, at 447, Greg is saying, is it possible with DataSnap to use a binary format instead of JSON? Well, if you if your method returns a, a stream, it will be a binary, naturally. But beyond that, even you, you can have a JSON representation of a, a binary stream too. So uh, I, I I think I I uh, showed this in my presentation. In a method that returns a string, if you end the method with a, a question mark and the JSON equals true parameter, it will convert the stream into uh, an array of bytes. And then you can use the same result as binary or a JSON. So if I got the question, that's the answer. The other thing for binary, if you do heavyweight callbacks where you open a channel, you can send anything back and forth you want to. Is that right, Kelber? Yeah, yeah, you're right. With with the heavyweight callback, you have this possibility to. to yeah, and then. Uh, custom objects based on Delphi classes, then there's C++ servers and Delphi RTTI. I mean, there is, C++ can, ha can work with the Delphi RTTI, just can't do anything if you've got custom attributes as well. Uh, so I know, I, I know we've done some blog posts here and there about, about working uh, with custom objects as it relates to data snap. So I, I don't know if, Kelver, you already have some of those links in your in your notes or maybe in, in some of that or we can uh, add some links to some articles as well. Not that I remember now but I can take a look again search for for it and attach to the presentation that will be available later that we will put on the, the material South Code Rage. Yeah, Brian Alexakis has this starting Code Rage X blog that uh, you can find on the community site, and we're going to be putting in for each session additional links uh, that showed up in the presentations, as well as other links we we've been finding. I, I started doing a little bit, and then I got a little behind, so I've got to go back through the sessions and remind myself and give Brian those links. But he's got a a blog, just go to the community.abarkado.com, choose Brian Alexakis blog, and it's probably his top most, most recent blog. It's probably near the top. If you just click on community.abarkado.com and then click blogs, you'll probably see this article where we're going to be collecting links and, and links to other, uh, that are mentioned in the articles and links to other things that are associated with some of the talks. Yeah, I'm trying to, to find it too. Uh, but I think there's there's no question. I can see no more question. Can you do you have any other there, David? No, that's it. Let me. I'm going to try to bring. Let me bring up uh, a couple things. This I'm going to put in the chat window the uh, link to the to the sort of Code Rage blog. I just put that in there. That's the long form URL. Uh, the short form is like embt.co slash, oh, let me, I should do this this way because otherwise I'm going to mess up, uh, slash CRX blog. So that's the, let me put that in the chat window. That's the short, uh, you know, the bit.ly, but it, it'll then go. So that's embt.co slash CRX hyphen blog, all lowercase. I have put that in the chat window for everyone. And the longer form version to the blog is in the uh, in the chat window now as well. So let me paste that into the Q and A log, and also that other one. I'll put that in the Q and A log so everybody can have it. Uh, there's always going to be more that people want to do, and I, I did have a couple comments as well on sort of scalability and and Kelver, you can. Uh, let me know if I'm crazy or not. Uh, we oftentimes people 
talk about, well, all this data they want to transfer, you know, and how large that might be, like to a mobile client from a data step middle tier. And, and really, the, we always have this advice about make sure your SQL statements are correct. You're only returning the data you want. FireDeck has caching. Uh, it's got the JSON FD uh, reflector for doing your updates uh, easily. Uh, so look at, do you really need to transfer all that data, or you can set FireDAC uh, to transfer some data and use this kind of window of moving data around. Uh, the second area is you mentioned connection pooling, both on DataSnap itself, but in FireDAC database connection pooling. You mentioned callbacks as another way. And also the final one for me in DataSnap is looking at the lifecycle property. Uh, what is it like command session server and decide, you know, like EMS just connect, you know, it's stateless. It, you connect, get what you need, come back. Connect, get what you need, come back. Send an update, come back. And you can create the same I, same thing by using the, I think it's the command life cycle. Is that right, Kelver? Yeah, that's it. If you use the the this life cycle that we have server session and request, if I'm not mistaken, this one is just uh, at uh, this class, this object will be leave only at the time of the request, so no no session will be will be generated with this kind of life cycle, and it's the best way to to have scal it's callable servers, uh, in my opinion. W one thing that uh, I think we need to to have in mind to keep in mind is that the how it's it's much better to have less information stored on the on the server so the more stateless you could be it will be better for your performance for your scalability just keep in mind develop your code thinking on it um, to as david said to select the minimum data you need don't transfer unnecessary data to your clients. Don't keep much information on session if possible. Keep n no information in sessions. The to this way you will have in my opinion you'll have the you will have better scalability. Sometimes it's not possible to do this. We need session in some cases. Uh, sometimes uh, and to to be stateless it's harder, a little bit harder to do, and we, using sessions it's easiest to do, we are more productive in, in the, in immediately talking about the time now, but in the future uh, when you are in your environment production, uh, it will be worse, so try to be more, the more stateless as possible. That's my opinion. And then finally, in, based on architecture, when I, when I think about on a mobile application, just as you might think in a browser, you know, you have like a master detail, for example, send some of the master rows down, but then fetch on demand to get the detail. We do this with like the Fish Fact app. You bring down the, the text part instead of the bitmap blob of the fish, you bring the text part and you load that in, and then when the user selects one of those, then you fetch on demand the picture that you need at that time, so you're not bringing all these bitmap blobs down. So think about that in your master detail for customer accounts, customer orders, all those kinds of things as well. You don't need to bring all the customers and all the orders down in a master detail or multi-view. You need to bring the customer selection list down and maybe the first selected customer's detail down, and then as you click, you know, the request goes back and, and FireDAC can help you and all of that and, and data snap. So just as we think in terms of web, we bring down parts of the text because that's really precise, well, condensed because it's text. And then, and you can even run a compression filter with data snap on the text. And then, you you know, the images load later, right? They, they get fetched on demand through the image sources. So you can think about... Uh, you can think about architectures like that, and those are very easy to do with DataSnap and FireDeck. Yeah, that's it. And another thing that I was uh, remember remembering is that 
uh, you can do things in background. So when the first time you get the orders, for example, you can start a task to prefetch your items from those orders and uh, expecting that the, the the way the user will interact with your application is click on, on the orders, you can start bringing those items to the to the mobile or to the client application in the background and the the new parallel library the task t task class will it's a good tool to do this job and the parallel library runs on all the platforms so it runs on iOS Android Windows OS 10 so uh, use the power I know Danny Wynn's going to do another session on parallel uh, parallel parallel programming library so in the Pascal track but uh, there's lots of other tricks, as Calvert mentions. So, and some of those we have collected into sort of best practices, blog posts, um, and, uh, and we need to just do more to help you, and we will. Okay. So, Calvert, thank you very much, and everybody, that looks like it for first day. Uh, we'll start again tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. Calvert, thank you so much. Thank you, David. It was good to hear you. Good to be with you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And I hope it, it would it could be helpful in some way. And feel free to stay in touch. Again, thank you very much, and have a, a good night.